What's going on? It's the Big Rig Bull, Texas Truck Accident Lawyer Rashard Alexander back in the building again today. And it is pretty late at night, actually. Uh, I have kind of went through the whole day. I don't have time to carry a camera around all day, at least not right now. Um, I went to court earlier this morning, uh, came back, probably got here at like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, something like that. Um, you know, try to work as much as I can because I just don't see how, you know, I don't see how solo, real solo lawyers, by yourself lawyers can do it um, if you don't work like tremendous hours. I mean, in the sense that if you have to go to court and you're coming back home, at, I mean, not home, you're going back to the office at like two o'clock and, you know, the normal office hours are what, like eight to five, nine to six, something like that. You got essentially like four hours, and that's if you that's if you sit if you sat down and you've had something to eat, um, to like just bang out whatever you have to do and then be done with it. And so I do so much stuff during the day that I have to, you know, I have to you know put in extra time at this point right now at least to get things going. But you know one thing that I do need to do um, sometime later this week, not tomorrow. Um, uh, not tomorrow, but sometime this week, I have to sit down and actually write out a description for a legal intern. Because I said that I was going to do that, um, you know, when I first started moving into this office. And I found someone potentially who can uh, <clears throat> serve as kind of a paralegal uh, or in that aspect or in that respect for me in the coming months, possibly. Um, you know, I don't know. I just don't really want to have a lot of turnover. My, that's my thing. And it seems like a lot of my friends who are solos, uh, that seems to be the problem or issue that a lot of them have is that, excuse me, I'm so, so I'm so tired. I'm sorry. Um, that seems to be the thing is that, you know, they, they have to deal with not necessarily the overhead, but just, you know, you put, you invest so much into training someone only to turn around to have them, you know, leave, um, not necessarily always for a better opportunity, you know, just, but it just doesn't work sometimes, you know, maybe they just don't have the work ethic that it is required of a law firm. I mean, you know, you come into work at a law firm, you know, I think the thing is, is that everyone kind of expects to be paid well. Um, even if you're at a small law firm, the expectation is that, you know, eventually if the, if the firm tends to do better then your pockets will too or at least that that's what I would think um, but I'm feeling I'm feeling that way about myself as far as like you know I just need to find someone who's really willing to work hard not necessarily as hard as me you know but you know when they come in to work do the work get it done on a timely basis every day and then um, you know like I need to find a legal intern and I'm I'm kind of like wondering like what are the specifications that you look for um, in someone who you want to be a legal intern. I mean, I've always kind of thought, you know, that, hey, you want the law review, you know, the mood court person, blah, 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 you know, that type of person. But at the same time, I mean, when you come out here into the real world and you start to actually do this stuff, it's, you know, a lot of times some of the most successful attorneys were not really like top of the class type people and you know it just kind of reinforces everything that you learn about life you know in a sense that you you go to school and they tell you all this stuff about you got to make good grades you got to make the best grades you got to do this and they tell you that in high school I'm sorry I'm so sorry <laughs> um they tell you that stuff in high school, they tell you that stuff in college and whatnot, but you know, the reality of the world is that when you come out here, I mean, there's so many connections that people make. I mean, there's a little layer of nepotism that exists in every profession, you know, I mean, and you know, it's all about connections, it's all about who you know, it's never about how smart you are, it's never about your education, it's never about any of that really, it's about who likes you, you know, and how well you get along with others, and what is your emotional intelligence, you know, what's that EQ, not your IQ, and those are the things that seem to really drive people upwards, you know, um, so I'm always just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of reevaluating what I think is important, I mean, because I've 
thought for a very long time that, you know, being top of the class and all that type of stuff is cool for a certain spectrum of people. You know what I mean? They need that because they need that to exist in the space that they're going to be in. Um, but the rest of us, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter as much. So, you know, I've been thinking that what I really kind of want to find is someone who maybe, you know, maybe they had to go through something traumatic in their lives. You know what I mean? Like what it's like the hardest thing that you've ever had to overcome. You know, um, that would kind of probably be one of my questions to a potential legal intern. You know, like what what have you had to encounter? What have you been through? You know, because I think um, I read something a while ago. It talked about like resilience being like the number one determiner of success. Um, determiner? I don't know if that's the word. Determinator? I don't know. I don't know. But grit or resilience is supposed to be like the top top value or something like that that will determine whether someone is successful in life or not. So I think, you know, one of the first things that I really want to know from a legal intern is like, you know, a little bit about your background. Like where have you, you know, where have you lived? What what have you been through? Have you seen different parts of the world? I mean, not necessarily, you know, travel the world, but just, you know, have you seen different parts of society? You know, have you traveled and lived in different pl in different states and cities? you know, throughout the U.S. I mean, you know, who do you interact with on a daily basis? Um, does everyone that you encounter uh, or deal with on a daily basis look like you, talk like you, walk like you, think like you, you know? Because I would like to um, have some people who have a more varied background, um, you know, as interns or and potentially as associates. Big Rig Bull, Texas Truck Accent Lawyer, Rashard Alexander, here again for episode 57. Today we are going to uh, smash a few classes together and knock a bit of them out all at once. So today we're going to actually talk about class 4 flammable solids and class 5 oxidizers and division 6.1 poisons and division 2.3 poisonous gases. All right, so without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing we need to know when we're talking about class four flammable solids and class five oxidizers is one of the biggest issues that you're dealing with is ventilation, proper ventilation for this type of hazardous material in order to avoid spontaneous combustion or fires in the back of the vehicle. All right, so the entire load must be contained within the body of the vehicle and the entire load can either be covered by a uh, tarp or it can be covered by the vehicle body, right? Um, when we're talking about the tailgate, obviously the tailgate must be securely fastened to avoid uh, uh, car lost cargo onto the highways and roadways. Um, the load cargo itself must be loaded dry and it must be kept dry in order to prevent spontaneous combustion. Um, like I said before, the main thing is adequate ventilation to prevent heating, spontaneous combustion, or fires. And um, the thing about watertight containers is that if it isn't shipped in a watertight container, then it doesn't have to be covered, okay? Um, moving on to pickup and delivery. So regulations regarding class four and five loads don't apply to pickup and delivery vehicles that are used entirely for that purpose in and around the city, all right. Uh, when it, we're not so when we're talking about that, we're talking about you know you're just moving around throughout the city because these regulations are going to apply to you know over the road or you know interstate trucking things of that nature, not just like traveling within the city itself. Uh, when we're talking about charcoal, the thing about charcoal is that it has to be kept completely dry because uh, ground charcoal, pulverized charcoal. You know, any type of broken down uh, component of charcoal, if it gets wet, it becomes much more hazardous uh, when it's wet. Um, so when you're piling uh, this type of um, hazardous material into uh, the load, I mean, into the, into the cargo tank or whatnot, uh, into the trailer, I'm sorry, 
Uh, you have to lay it horizontally and pile it with a space of at least 3.9 inches wide for effective air circulation. And you have to maintain this, uh, this air circulation on these rows um, throughout the transport. Okay. Um, when you're talking about how high it can be piled, you're talking about the bags can be piled no closer than 5.9 inches or 15 centimeters from the top of the vehicle with a closed body. All right, so the main thing we're pulling from this is if it's laid horizontally, we're talking about 3.9 inches. If we're talking about how high it's going to be stacked, we're talking about 5.9 inches from um, the top of a, a vehicle with a closed body. All right, when we're talking about smokeless powder or gunpowder for the most part, uh, which is a Division 4.1 hazardous material, it's smokeless powder for, for small arms in quantities not exceeding 100 pounds net mass of material may be transported in a uh, motor vehicle. Now, if we're talking about nitrates, the thing about nitrates is that the, uh, the trailer or whatever it's going to be transported in has to be swept clean. Okay, uh, it has to be free from any projections or anything that could damage the bags, open them up. Um, you know, it can be uh, a closed or an open type, but if it's an open type trailer, it must be securely covered. It's common sense. Um, and if it's not, and it doesn't have to be uh, loaded in an all uh, metal closed vehicle, except if you're talking about aluminum alloys or if you're talking yeah, aluminum uh, nitrate uh, with organic coating. Okay. Moving right along to Division 6.1 poisons and 2.3 poisonous gases. So when we're loading and unloading these types of materials, um, there could be no interaction between the packaging of any 6.1 or 2.3 uh, hazardous material. Can't, I mean, there can't be any you know, commingling of the packaging or packages at all. Okay? Um, a package that is bearing poison toxic or poison inhalation hazard cannot be transported with any type of edible foodstuffs, edible materials uh, for humans or animals unless it's overpacked in a metal drum and it fits the specifications of section one, uh, 173.25C um, or it's loaded into a closed unit, uh, closed unit device and the foodstuffs, feed or other edible materials are also loaded into another closed unit load device. Okay. When we're talking about, let me see if this pin will work a little bit better. When we're talking about PG3, remember we're talking about PGs uh, in earlier vlogs. We're basically basically talking about the package group levels. Uh, package group three or PG3 is the lowest level. Uh, PG3 in, uh, in package bearing poison label or a PG3 that's adjacent to a poison label cannot be transported with edible foodstuffs for human or animal consumption unless conditions normally incident to transport prevents commingling of the hazardous material with the foodstuff cargo. I mean, basically what they're saying is, you know, if it has a PG3 uh, package group in the poison label, or there's a PG uh, label right beside the actual poison uh, label itself, these cannot be um, transported with like food for the most part that humans or animals would eat unless they can be completely kept separate. Um, a motor carrier may not transport a package bearing uh, or required to bear poison, number one, that's label toxic, number two, poison gas or poison inhalation hazard label in the driver's compartment, including the sleeper berth of a motor vehicle. I mean, it's common sense. Why would someone want to put poison gas and you know anything like that in the actual uh, sleeper berth or the, the truck cab with them. It's crazy. It's a crazy idea. Um, highway transport by private or uh, contract motor carrier of a division 6.1 package group 1 hazard zone A toxic by inhalation material that is a hazardous material may be transported on the same vehicle with a class 3, 4, 5, and 8 materials if the, if the Division 6.1 Package Group 1 Hazard Zone A hazardous material is number one, filled and packed by the offeror, number two, it's packaged in combination packages as specified in 173.226C, 
uh, its own pallets, and it's separated from class three, four, five, and eight materials by a minimum horizontal distance or buffer zone of at least nine feet, okay? And I believe that buffer zone can be hazardous or non-hazardous material uh, as long as it's com compatible with uh, the hazardous material that's being transported. The last thing is arsenical uh, materials. And I may be saying that wrong because I'm not a scientist, but I believe that's how you say it because I know how to say arsenic, so I'm pretty sure it's arsenical materials. So we're talking about arsenical dust, arsenic, trioxide, and sodium arsenate. And the thing with those is that those materials may be loaded into sift proof steel hopper or dump vehicle bodies if they are equipped with waterproof and dust proof covers secured on all openings. Arsenical materials may not be loaded and unloaded around persons that are not connected to the transportation of this particular hazardous substance because it, this is very hazardous substance if you inhale it or anything. We, we, you know, we always hear about people being killed by like their wives or ex-husbands by them sprinkling a little bit of arsenic in their food you know uh, throughout the years or whatnot so even a little bit of something like this can be very deadly to the, the, the uh, general public right so after transport of, uh, of any type of ar arsenic material the vehicle must be flushed with water or other means to cleanse it or erase the traces of the arsenic material before transporting any other cargo. So that wraps up today's episode 57 vlog uh, where we've covered class 4 flammable solids, class 5 oxidizers, division 6.1 poisons, division 2.3 poisonous gases. Um, if this is uh, helpful to you, feel free to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, the red subscribe button, and uh, share this freely, please. Um, and I will see you again tomorrow for episode 58. This is the Big Red Bull, Texas Truck Accident Lawyer, Rashard Alexander, signing out and hoping you have a blessed day.